Hello, Farming Secrets Network and community. We're super excited to bring you another Let's Talk Soil session today. I'm joined by Alan. Hello, Alan. How are you doing today? I'm good. Thanks, Ray. Excellent. And where are you joining us from today? Um, I'm at home in uh, Sarsfield in East Gippsland in Victoria. Awesome. Um, very, very nice. Very nice. And um, I, I, I'm always really curious, you know, what does soil mean to you, Alan? Uh, well... Soil is, that's what everything is based on. That's what all farming and, and um, pest management and everything is based on soil. Human health is based on soil. Um, I came from a, um, a farming background. We had a, a small uh, farm producing merino sheep in the northeast of Victoria. Um, and I used to love growing my own vegetables at that time. I had my own garden and yeah, so I, I got really keen then. Um, when I was at university, I came across Rachel Carson's book, Silent Spring, and that had a big effect on me, where I realised just how the, the chemical era is just doing so much phenomenal damage to, um, to the environment. Um, but, but it was about 1974, I think, I did a... Um, a horticulture course at Burnley Horticultural College in Melbourne and as part of that course we did soil science. So soil science was learning the roles of nitrogen, phosphorus and potassium and not much else. And in plant protection in that unit, yeah, which chemicals do you use to control uh, which pest, including what chemical do you use to control those pesky earthworms in lawns that make these little um, mounds on the, on, the, uh, on the lawn that you've got to get rid of. So all, all that sort of thing. Um, yeah, I was rather horrified. But <clears throat> we finally got our own uh, land in 1985 in, at Sarsfield in East Gippsland. We've been there ever since. I had gardened in every different place we'd lived in, in Melbourne and um, in the Western District of Victoria. And I'd always had a good vegetables growing in that garden. When I came here, I just had no idea how poor soil could be. Uh, it was just really, really deficient in pretty well everything, as a lot of East Gippsland is. Um, where I chose to have the vegetable garden, there was about two inches of topsoil. Um, and then it went into a, a heavy clay. I, at that stage, I'd been influenced by no dig gardening. So I didn't do any digging in that ground. I planted, I weeded it, no, I, sorry, I mowed it. Uh, I planted the vegetables and I mulched heavily all around it. And since that time, the garden has never been dug and it gets, it gets mulched all the time and, um, and I put compost on it. Now, the, instead of two inches of topsoil, it's a foot of topsoil and that's with no digging whatsoever. So I think it just shows the power of plants, roots and biology to create soil where there really wasn't soil before. Mm, I love that. It really signifies how like humans getting in the way actually slows that process down. If we just yeah. let mother nature do her thing, um, it just works, you know, yeah. love that. Now I mentioned the uh, the NPK fertilizer system that I've been taught at uh, Torticultural College. Well, from about the mid nineties onwards, there, there was a lot of, um, visiting US soil scientists coming here. And I went to hear all of them, Neil Kinsey, Arden Anderson, uh, Elaine Ingham, Gary Zimmer. And I just found it tremendously difficult to unlearn what I had learned in soil science at Horticultural College. Um, to, to, to realize that no, NPK wasn't the issue. The issue was calcium and magnesium and trace elements and you've got to get those uh, in order so it means i i really do have um 
quite some understanding of the difficulty farmers and soil scientists who've been brought up on, up on that system to try and uh, and relearn to uh, to adopt a different way of looking at soil. Now, in uh, I think it was two thousand and seven, um, I was uh, after I'd done the Elaine Ingham course, I was offered a job at a, an organic beef farm in. Uh, in Gippsland called Strathfield Say Estate. And my role there was a research scientist. The farm was run by Australian Landscape Trust, uh, sort of a philanthropic organization. I wanted to test the various different uh, inputs that organic farmers were using in order to improve the soil, just to see what really worked, what didn't work. So I set up a lot of different trial plots because the farm was quite big, um, 1800 hectares, no, about 1100 hectares of grazing land. There are a lot of different soil types there and different vegetation types. So I ended up doing seven different trial sites uh, to, to test all of the different types of soils, the, the light sandy soils, the saline clays and everything in between. So I put out uh, different inputs like uh, kelp, liquid kelp, um, fish emulsion, compost tea. I made compost tea using the uh, the system that Elon Ingham was teaching us. Molasses, lime, dolomite, gypsum, uh, coal ash, and about half a dozen different commercially available biological products. I monitored them over a couple of years um, just to see what was happening. So I did microbe counts to see what was the effect before and after. Uh, so after one week, after a month, after six months, I did, I did those counts many, many times. Um, I also measured the compaction of the soil um, and the, the sodicity uh, using the Emerson test, the electrical conductivity, and also just visually. And I was actually, I thought I was a total failure as a, as a scientist because I could not get any significant results. I could get some small results. Uh, gypsum had the biggest effect really, both positive and negative. It severely su suppressed um, biological activity. And this is, Elaine Ingham had said that in the course too. She said anything over 250 kilos per hectare was very hard on soil biology. I found 500 kilos per hectare was okay, but um, it, it, a thousand Per hectare and 2,000 per hectare was deadly on the soil biology. It actually did release, uh, it improved the compaction of that soil and it reduced the sodicity, but it did a lot of other, it did a lot of harm to the soil biology, which might in the long term come back. I suppose it would. Um, but I, yeah, I was quite astounded um, what happened there. Yeah, I love that point too about just sometimes feeling like you're fixing one problem can actually create another problem because putting too much could be causing a, a side effect or another dilemma. And if you're only chasing one cause and effect, then you're kind of missing this other bigger picture. Uh, yeah. I, I love that you've highlighted that point as well. Yeah, yeah. Um, I found some of the treatments gave small increases in biological activity, but it was not significant. And there was no noticeable difference in the pasture growth or pasture color. So I concluded, at least for a grazing situation, it was not worth doing. And I was not going to advocate to graziers to use those methods. And I was also, uh, included in that was that I was not going to advocate the use of compost tea. Since I'd done a two-week course and I couldn't get it to work, then 
I, how am I going to um, to demonstrate to to a novice um, and, and and recommend them to use that? So yeah, I felt it was all very disappointing to me. But then finally, uh, I. I got management to agree to do some rotational grazing trials. And um, it didn't cost all that much. There were a lot of paddocks there anyway. There were about, oh, I don't know, 30, 40 paddocks. And we divided a lot of those up just with single electric wires, which works quite well with cattle. Um, and that included um, the corridors so that they could get to the water troughs uh, quite easily. Moving them was very easy. You, you, you'd go out there and if their heads were all down and they were eating, they were happy. They didn't need to be moved. But if, you, if they saw you coming and they all stood up and they were bellowing at you, it meant they wanted to go. So you just open the gate and put them in the next run. So it was extremely easy doing that. Um, so there, we had quite a lot of cattle there. There's about um, 400 cows plus their calves. So we amalgamated all of those. So we had all these, you know, 800 animals and we put them in um, usually a maximum of five hectares and they'd be in that five hectares for one or two days and then they would move on and we would bring them back once that pasture had completely recovered. And in some paddocks that might be two months, in other paddocks it might be six months, and some, they only, the paddocks only got grazed once a year. Um, so it wasn't a set rotation going from, you know, going around in the circle for one paddock to another. It was worked out on a monthly basis where they were going to go to for the next month. Um, so yes, this grazing sequence was something I, I, it took a bit of time working it all out because I have to go around every paddock and, and do calculations of, of how much feed was available in each paddock. Yeah, um, I, I love the, uh, just two things I want to highlight there is the fact that you were observing the animal and using that as a feedback loop to know what was right. You know, the animals on the land, nature will tell you what needs to happen. Um, and then also planning, you know, planning ahead. Uh, there, there's two really good points that you've mentioned there. So I just wanted to highlight that for everyone who's, who's listening. Yeah, uh, and another thing that I did was uh, working out um, how how long the pasture available uh, was going to last. Um, and I always like to be 120 days ahead. So if we get got down to 90 days ahead, 80 days, I thought it's time to get rid of some animals. Um, and that's easier said than done, but <laughs> yeah. Uh, but it worked out sometimes. Anyway, the results of this were just outstanding. It gave the results that I was looking for using those biological trials that I never got. The pasture improved immensely. The weeds declined phenomenally. Uh, we had some paddocks that were, you know, 50% cape weed and it went down to less than 5% in one year. Um, sorrel went down enormously. Um, cooch. Uh, barley grass, Parramatta grass, the, all of the weedy uh, grasses, particularly the perennials, um, they really declined uh, enormously. And the beneficial grasses increased uh, and took their place. And we went from having 50% uh, ground cover in autumn up to 100% all of the year. And this made such a, such a difference to, to the pasture, to the carrying capacity, um, to the stock health too. We were having a lot of stock health problems with um, having to pull calves, um, having milk fever, um, it, but th this and, and intestinal worms. So this solved all of those problems. The, the other thing I, I did was um, check what was the, what did it do to soil carbon? And it was in 
I think it was 2010, um, I did some baseline tests in, in four different paddocks uh, and got, got um, soil carbon, total carbon and, and uh, labile carbon tests done. And then um, four years later, I did the same tests again. And there was a very big difference. In the topsoil, the uh, amount of soil carbon went out up 20%. This is in the top 10 centimetres. Between 10 and 30 centimetres down there, it went up by 40%. And then from the 30 centimetre to 50 centimetre um, depth, it went up 200%. Now, admittedly, that was from a very low base, but it, it was a huge difference. Um, and the carbon can only be deposited at that depth by the action of plant roots. And I put it down to the rotational grazing system, which allows plants to grow uh, properly uh, and photosynthesize well and put that carbon into the soil where it is safe. Whereas if it's from decomposing matter on the surface, yeah, it does a lot of good. It supports microbes and all that, but it's all pretty well all labile carbon, which doesn't stay there. It just disappears. I love that. Another, another example of just letting plants and roots do the job that naturally occurs and what they're designed to do. And I think it's really important to understand the depth of that carbon as well, not just the top, so, you know, the top organic matter that a lot of people refer to. Yeah. Yes. Um, yes, it was, it was a good experience. Yeah. Um, I'm retired now. I'm not working there anymore. Um, it was a bit hard to maintain that system because it got inundated with kangaroos, uh, which destroyed the, <laughs> the ability to adjust the stocking rate um, and various other commercial pressures um, and then severe drought as well. Um, but anyway, I, I concluded that um, I would, after that, I would advocate for uh, a well-planned grazing system as by far the best means of improving soil. Now some uh, fertilizers hadn't been used on it for 15 years uh, up till the time I finished. And uh, people said, well, you're gonna lose the clover if you're not going to put out superphosphate. The clover really increased enormously um, without any superphosphate being added. Yeah, so it, it proved a lot to me and uh, um, I will I continue to advocate that system to other people. Awesome. I love that. Thank you so much for sharing um, your, your experience. And I think that's just a real you know, testament to the experience that you've had and the ability to have access to this land and have all these test sites. I'm curious, you mentioned one thing about really struggling to unlearn what you had learned in regards to NPK. Mm. How did you get to that point of unlearning like what was that aha moment of going i really need to break this mold and do things differently do you remember that moment or that phase in your life well i'd been i'd been operating for about 10 years in within our local organic agriculture association um, and so i was very much against the use of chemical fertilizers but i didn't quite understand I thought well you've, you've got to replace them in some way you've got to use more manure or or, or, or something like that um, but it was because I suppose these uh, these scientists were bringing something something new and it was part of the organic movement I, and I was at that stage developing starting to develop an organic farming course. Uh, for TAFE. So I wanted to understand of all, all these these systems and I just found it tremendously difficult at first um, to get out of that NPK framework and completely reorient the, um, the way of thinking. Um, and th this was, it was sort of based on the, the Albrecht system of soil science. And since then, uh, I've um, I've learned far more about soil biology too, um, 
So yeah, you could you could. Uh, you, I, I ask myself sometimes, how important is this um, is the Albrecht system? How important is the biology system? And where should you start? Should you start with biology, or should be you start with uh, with getting the getting a balanced soil? Um, and I tend to think both are really important, mm -hmm. and it doesn't particularly matter where you start. Yeah. Starting yeah. somewhere is better than nothing. <laughs> oh, that's right. Yes. Yeah, 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 absolutely. And so with all these years and years and knowledge and experience and meeting some great, great people from all around the world, um, what do you look for, uh, for for healthy soil? Like what's a what's a sign that makes you feel like that's a good soil or healthy soil? Well, if I'm looking at a pasture, and sometimes people get me to come and look at their pastures and uh, give opinions, I see some dreadful pastures. Um, and it's sort of, it's very hard to talk, tell people that what they're doing is totally wrong. So I try to be diplomatic around it, but I don't know if this works. <laughs> um, but yeah, weediness, you know, the uh, weeds of poverty, like cushion, sorrel and uh, bent grass, uh, that sort of thing. Yes, yeah, so I, I look at them, they're, well, they're very obvious and, and anyone, anyone can see them. Um, so I want to see, for, for, in a pasture, I want to see a lush pasture with uh, beneficial perennial grasses and some annuals and clovers. There needs to be legumes in there too. Um, in a garden, um, the soil needs to be soft. Um, and the soil needs to be covered all the time. You need to be able to put your hand in the soil uh, and you see see earthworms wriggling around in it. So those are important signs. Um, but also you don't want to see uh, water lying on top of the soil. Uh, soils have to drain properly, yet they have to be able to hold plenty of water as, as well. And this is where you, you must have that that high carbon content. So yeah, they're, they're the things I look for. And you can, if you get a sharp, uh, get a piece of strong wire, number eight wire that used to be used for fencing and push that down in the, in the soil, you can feel where there's a hard pan. And if there's a hard pan, it's really hard to push that wire in. That's a big barrier to roots. So I take this wire around sometimes and poke it into the soil and and uh, and just see what happens. Yeah. Yeah. Awesome. Such a great skill to and 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 craft to to uh, get used to. You know, being an observer of the land and just you know understanding the beneficial uh, uh, diversity of, of plant life and bug life and worms and the softness. And it's definitely an art that takes time. Uh, to to nurture in your in your mind and to learn that and I think it's uh, uh, amazing that you've got this ability to share this now and um, and and you mentioned before that you're retired what keeps you busy now what are you working on um, these days I pre prepared a lot of courses for an organisation called Mekong Organics um, and so I've been doing some teaching teaching organic farming in Vietnam I still do quite a few different talks. Our local organic association has a, a monthly skills session and I'm usually um, involved in that. Um, yeah, various things like that. I write a, a short a book on, um, on the, how corporations are screwing farmers. Um, and that, that's, that was published a few years ago. And I recently did a series of seminars on, on that too. Um, yeah, at, at the moment, because of the coronavirus and because we got burnt out in bushfires, I've been uh, trying to repair the damage uh, from that. And in fact, the coronavirus was a benefit because <laughs> it meant that I couldn't really do anything else. I couldn't go to Vietnam and, and, and work over there. So I've had uh, all this year uh, trying to uh, re repair the damage here. Um, and and get everything back to what it is. We've we've only got five hectares, and um, apart from the vegetable garden and orchard, well, the orchard had to be replaced. Uh, it, but apart from that, it, there's uh, quite a lot of bushland, and that's come up in 
just a phenomenal amount of black wattles that I'm trying to deal with. Right. Excellent. We seem very busy and I really appreciate um, you taking the time to share your wisdom and knowledge with the Farming Secrets community. And uh, just, you know, any final thoughts that you'd like to leave everyone thinking about when it comes to soil health? Stop using chemicals. <laughs> That's a really important one. Um, animals are really important in, in, in farming. Um, so um, if, it, if, it, if it's only a grazing property, then you must rotate them. If you are cropping, you really need animals in the non-cropping season in order to deal with the growth there, fertilize the soil, um, rather than poison it with, um, with, with herbicides. Yeah, that's, that, that's it. Yeah. yeah and, that. and also- Don't use chemicals and get animals into the, into the ecosystem. Yeah, <laughs> and keep learning, keep yes, going to really. seminars, um, Zoom meetings, um, and, and read books. There's a phenomenal amount of literature out there now of, of benefit to farmers. There's multitudes of good videos to, uh, to, to look at. So um, there's really, th there's no dearth of, um, of freely available knowledge there for people to grab hold of. Love that. That's a great thought. So uh, I'm, we're going to leave it there. Alan, thank you so much for sharing your wisdom with our community today. And even to myself, I'm grateful to have met you and been part of even putting some of your course material through our Farming Secrets Circle membership website. So very, very happy with that and, and, uh, and, and look forward to a lot of the future projects that we will do together as well. Yes. Thanks, Ray. Yes. No worries. Well, Farming Secrets community, until next time, remember to get your hands dirty and start digging deeper into your soils.